Hey folks. So my name is Edmund, and tonight I want to tell you a wild story of how a Russian named Roman Fedorovich von Ungern Sternberg got drunk enough to conquer Mongolia. So first, where the fuck is Mongolia? Well, one answer is that Mongolia is in Asia, like right there. A creamy marshmallow smored between the giant authoritarian graham crackers of Russia and China. <laughs> but that guy would give you a different answer. That's Temujin, better known as Chinggis or Genghis Khan. If you ask him, the whole enchilada is pretty much Mongolia. And this guy is, is pretty much the only exception to that old adage slash random princess bride line about starting a land war in Asia. <laughs> and to this day sets the record for the largest contiguous terrestrial empire. But 1919 was a crazy year for Mongolian geography, as it was for philately, which is just dirty talk for stamp collecting. This is a philatelic map showing the creation of temporary nation states as they sprang up after the Tsarist government in St. Petersburg had fallen to the Red Army. What you'll notice is that the retreating Russian elites basically set up a government in Omsk, which didn't last that long, uh, and then got totally routed by the Reds, ending up in Daurya, or the Transbaikal, or Zhabaikal, which means beyond Baikal, in the same way that the Zha in my last name means beyond the mountains, the Goren, or the Zha in Zaum means beyond reason, the Russian poetry movement. And beyond reason is a great place to finally get to our anti-hero, Roman Maximilian, the Bloody Baron, looking pleasantly deranged in this image, wearing his characteristic yellow tunic and St. George's cross. Born in 1885 to Austrian parents, Ungern grew up, grew up in a Teutonic enclave of Estonia and was drawn to the military mostly for its promise of allowing him to uh, have his particular brand of sadism get free reign. Basically, this guy was a violent drunk who beat the shit out of anyone around him. Uh, he, as a cadet, was disciplined 25 times for overly getting into fistfights with his own men and for saber dueling, which was a thing you could do. <laughs> Ungern first saw deployment at the end of the disastrous Russo-Japanese conflict of 1904, just in time for the Russian Empire to have its ass royally handed to it by a vastly superior Japanese navy. And he felt, yeah, <laughs> let's... Yeah, Russo-Japanese War. Um, and he, <laughs> he felt personally enraged that the Tsar had been defeated. The guy loved the Tsar. After the Russo-Japanese War, Ungern was assigned to a Cossack division in far eastern Russia, where he learned to practice military Buddhism, smoke hashish and opium, and get even more ragingly drunk than he'd previously been able to. His random bouts of cruelty included forcing his own men to jump into freezing lakes, sicking wolves on them, and shooting at them during card games for no reason. <laughs> then, World War I happened and he was like, all right, I got this. <laughs> he fought with the Nurchinsk Cossacks against the Germans and was decorated numerous times for what many called absurd acts of bravery, mostly involving attacking German artillery units on cavalry with knives. <laughs> this was like a multi-year episode of Man versus Car, <laughs> and did not end particularly well for the Russians, but as usual, Ungern miraculously survived. But he got in trouble for drunkenly assaulting another officer, and was once again shipped off to far eastern Russia, basically, to chill out. <laughs> Except there wasn't a lot of chilling to do. By 1917, shit is really hitting the fan. Another hothead takes a train ride, and all of a sudden, all bets are off. By 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is signed, and the Red Army is on the march eastward, 
having encircled a random 60,000 unit of, uh, person unit of Czech mercenaries in the Volga, and they are closing in on the Baikal. Which is exactly where Ungern is headed, to again serve as a lieutenant to the equally deranged Ataman Grigory Simonyev, who is a Cossack leader turned warlord and head of this new nation state in the Trans Baikal. That's Simonyev. Now, time out. Because while this conflagration is happening, it's worth noting that a major cultural change has happened, and Ungern, like many white Russians, has become spellbound by the practice of an esoteric pseudo-religion propagated by Helena Blavatsky called Theosophy. <laughs> Woo! Not science. Um, <laughs> This set of teachings is the precursor to what we in the Bay Area regard as the modern New Age movement, and it mixes a number of Hindu and Buddhist ideas with various fortune-telling practices, including numerology and astrology. Uh, writing his letters in the influence of theosophy, the novelist D.H. Lawrence noted, quote, the great le uh, leaning of the German spirit is once more eastward towards Russia, towards Tartary. The positivity of our civilization has broken. The influences that come, come invisibly out of Tartary, so that all Germany reads beast men and gods with a kind of fascination, returning again to the fascination of the destructive east, the one that produced Attila, or that produced Attila. And Beast Men and Gods was a book written basically about Ungern and his crazy adventures. So this brings us back to what's happening in Mongolia, which is at the time under Chinese rule, and the Chinese have not been good rulers. They've implemented a reign of terror, and the dethroned Buddhist leader, the Bogud Khan, uh, is the, the third most uh, powerful figure in Buddhism, behind the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama, and at this time, he is nearly blind from leading a uh, libertine life of syphilis-giving habits. Um, and he is deeply pissed off at the Chinese. So that when Ungern shows up, he's thinking, all right. <laughs> Screw you guys. I'm going to Mongolia. So that's what Ungern says to the rest of the white troops. Um, and it's not exactly hard to see why he might have been interested, given his theosophist tendencies, towards venturing into eastern Russia and to leaving the Transbaikal troops and establishing what he believed would be the new resurrection of the destined empire, led by him, the reincarnation of Genghis Khan. It's pretty wild. And that's science, yeah. Uh, and this is where the, re the wheels truly come off. Uh, in, in two battles from late 1920 and early 1921, Ungern takes a group of men, pieces out, breaks with uh, his troops that are in, uh, in Transbaikal, and heads towards Urga, which is where modern Ulaanbaatar is, and hammers this Chinese garrison with his ragged division of starving Cossacks, who at this point are basically just desperate for food and maybe like a place to take their boots off. Um, he takes the city and reestablishes the first independent Mongolian state in 300 years. <laughs> yeah, wild. And on February 6, 1921, the Bogod Khan is crowned ruler of Mongolia. So, you know, the thing about this guy and kind of about some other people who are super into theosophy, hates Jews. Um, and so literally the first thing he does is like, all right, well, we sewed this up, let's kill all the Jews. Um, it was a move that was destined to be repeated by people wearing that Buddhist symbol, weird coincidence. Um, and, yeah, basically a lot of things that happened after that were similarly unpleasant. He killed all the Bolsheviks, he killed all the Jews, um, and we know from first-hand accounts that Unger not only encouraged and ordered this violence, but he partook in it and indeed delighted in it, because he was a 
totally pathological, murderous asshole. Uh, but the Red Army was not far behind. By July of that year, they had engaged Ungern's Asiatic Cavalry Division, encircled the city, and were doing to him what he had just done to the Chinese. Um, by this time, his troops had basically had enough, um, and it is uh, estimated by historians that this photo uh, of him was taken shortly before his own troops took him out back and shot him, because <laughs> you, you just can't do that forever. Um, <laughs> since his death, Ungern has become memorialized in some of the weirder parts of popular culture, including comic books, YouTube videos, tumblers, and uh, several amazing books, of which the best one, if you're interested in this guy and his wild life, I would encourage you to read James Palmer's uh, The Bloody White Baron. And he remains one of the most enigmatic figures of the Russian Civil War, a murderous, drunken psychopath who conquered Mongolia as the self-described reincarnation of Genghis Khan and ruled it for a full fucking eight months. <laughs> so, I conclude with this. Let us raise a glass to the legacy of this wild man whose face alone could probably give most people who met him nightmares enough to last for the rest of their natural lives.